organizing uh, can maybe give like an overview of the conversation this week, like what sort of uh, how people are connecting, where they're connecting from just generally, it would be great. We have so many people that I guess we, we kind of uh, won't be able to kind of run through intros at the beginning, but maybe through the conversation or Q&A, we could get a sense of how we're all positioned and, and where we're positioned differently and what kinds of things we're working on in common and try to make the best use of the conversation uh, from knowing each other. I'm sure you all know each other in different ways, but um, uh, so yeah, maybe that would be good contextually. And then I'm sure Ahmed will give this up in a second. Yes, yeah, sure. I'll start and then I'll let anyone else fill in. Um, so we're three organizations hosting this volunteer summit. This is the third uh, one that we host. Um, it's us Reestablish Richmond and Sacred Heart Center and um, the IRC, which is the resettlement agency here. Um, and and it's been a week-long event, all virtual this year. Uh, joining in mostly on the calls have been, I think, partners and local volunteers. I don't know if anyone wants to add anything else. Maybe everyone can go ahead and put their name and sort of how they're connected to this conference and the chat so that everybody can see that. Hey, sorry about that. I'm back. My internet was being strange. Welcome back. Um, thanks for that overview and, and for the chat prompt. Um, I do. Um, there we go. All right, and everyone see everything? Yeah, that looks yes. good to me. Yes, okay. thank you. All right, so we're getting some responses in the chat. Um, Alyssa Malinowski is with the Office of New Americans. Um, Wayne is with Sacred Heart Center. Lindsay, Sacred Heart Center volunteer, uh, Masters of Social Work Intern at Health Brigade. There's Laura, who is a teacher and, and um, working with immigrant and refugee communities. Leia, our director of economic empowerment. Robin, also with Reestablish Richmond. Um, there are people from the Islamic Center, Sacred Heart Center again. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm going to start and introduce our speakers. So again, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Helen Zainuddin and I'm the Director of Volunteer Engagement with Reestablish Richmond. I'm really excited to, to be introducing our speakers for this final session of FRAVES for this year's summit. They couldn't have joined if this summit wasn't virtual, so at least we have that. Uh, joining us all the way from Texas is Ahmed Bedir. He is a poet, multimedia artist, social entrepreneur, and former Iraqi refugee working at the intersection of creativity, displacement, and youth empowerment. Ahmed's work seeks to combine poetry, archival collections, and multimedia to explore the complexities of migration, identity, and self-expression with a focus on reframing and reclaiming the power of tragedy. He is the author of the recently published While the Earth Sleeps, We Travel, Stories, Poetry, and Art from Young Refugees Around the World, featuring a foreword by actor and UNHCR Goodwill Ambassador Ben Stiller. He is the founder and the executive director of Narratio. Welcome, Ahmed. I'm also honored to be introducing Dr. Bryce Nordquist all the way from New York. He is an associate professor and Dean's Professor of Community Engagement at Syracuse University, working at the intersection of community literacies, education and mobility studies. His public scholarship and creative projects attend to relations of languages and literacies across media, educational and occupational institutions, material and digital spaces and cultural and geopolitical borders. Dr. Bryce is author of Literacy and Mobility. He is co-director of the Narratio Fellowship. Thank you both for being here. And I also wanna take the opportunity to congratulate you on the recent collaboration with National Geographic. I'll let you tell us more about that. 
Thank you so much, Helen, for the thoughtful and generous uh, introduction. It's so, so wonderful to be with uh, with all of you here, uh, just seeing our, the chat and uh, seeing where everyone's coming from and what everyone's up to. It's really an honor to share this space with you. And, and we're so, we've been really looking forward to this presentation, um, you know, all week, all month. Um, so it's, it's wonderful to, to be here with you all. Um, you know, just to kind of give you a general idea of, of how, we, uh, how we've structured this session so far, I'll, we'll, we have a presentation prepared uh, on, our, on, on our fellowship program, and then we'd love to reserve the last, you know, 20 to 25 minutes, maybe 30 minutes or so um, to just hear from you and hear any questions that you might have. Um, so if that's all right with everyone, we can, uh, we can, we can dive in. I'll turn it over to Bryce, um, you know, just here uh, briefly, if you'd like to, to say anything to kick us off, and then we can dive right in. Uh, I thought that was great. It's really good to see uh, see and hear from you all. We're just, yeah, we're so excited to share some ideas and to, to get ideas. And um, we're uh, particularly excited for the, the conversation uh, to follow. Um, but if there's any point in the, in the middle of describing this program and the kind of, you know, the orientation, the theory underlying it, uh, please don't hesitate to stop us, raise your hands and say, you've been talking to us on Zoom for too long. We all know that Zoom stamina like wanes. And if you all have been doing this conferencing for a week and it's a Friday late afternoon and you just need to hear somebody else's voice, including your own, then please just you know stop us in our tracks, and we're uh, we're happy to kind of redirect and and answer questions in the middle of things. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, thanks again for inviting us and and for making time uh, to join. Um, we're excited to be here. Awesome. Everyone can see the screen, okay? And there's nothing embarrassing on it, right? Awesome. All right, can dive dive right in. Um, so as uh, Helen mentioned, as, as Bryce briefly mentioned as well, uh, we're here today on behalf of Neratio, uh, which is a global organization and online platform that seeks to activate, support, and highlight the creative expression of displaced young people across uh, the world. Uh, we really, we envision a world uh, that is made up of a global collective of displaced young people that are trained to share their own stories on their own terms as leaders, stakeholders, and active members of their communities. Uh, you know, we've been able to, to work on this uh, mission and work towards this vision for the past uh, about five years. Um, I started Neratio back in, in 2015 uh, when I was a junior in, in high school. Um, inspired by my own kind of personal uh, journey. My family came over to the U.S. in uh, 2008. We were resettled, uh, you know, as refugees. Uh, we left Iraq in 2006, moved to Syria. We were there for a couple of years, uh, you know, as refugees applied for refugee status. And then we're uh, among the very, very lucky, you know, 1% of all refugees who end up getting resettled. Um, I know that's a figure that you're all very, fam very familiar with. Um, and, and so, you know, I, my family was part of that. I always like to start every presentation um, with a picture of the stamp. This is the stamp that we got on our passports uh, once we arrived on, on May 19th, 2008, um, you know, in New York, that was our, our port of entry. Uh, we went from Damascus to Budapest, Budapest to New York City, New York City to Chicago, and then Chicago to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, which was where we were first resettled. Uh, and uh, Neratia was born uh, you know, for you, a few years later, about um, was it? Yeah, like seven years after our time in the U.S. But it was during uh, the start of high school where a family friend said, hey, why don't you start writing about, you know, your own family story, your own family journey? And, you know, as a kid, you don't really want to make yourself be any different than anyone else. So I wasn't sure if we even had a story to tell, um, much less how, how to tell it. But you know, I started by just writing, writing, and, and uh, I started a small blog for, for my work. Um, I was uh, able to go to a, uh, I got a scholarship to go to a, a journalism conference in Washington, D.C., and they said, you have to make a blog for your conference. So I went all out, got a domain, uh, .com domain, and, you know, I was 14, 15, and um, the world kind of opened then. I realized, you know, me trying to figure out what it meant to be, you know, an Iraqi American Muslim refugee was of interest to other people. And that, you know, I could, in, in the process of trying to figure that out, that I could, you know, maybe potentially help others do the same. And so that small blog turned into, uh, into Neratio. 
first it was just that online platform, just to, you know, begging classmates to submit their work, to publish their poems, their artwork, um, you know, films, whatever kind of creative work they had. And then we started doing workshops for the local resettlement community, a resettled community here in Houston. At this point, we had moved down from South Dakota down to Houston in 2012 to start high school. Um, and this, again, slowly but surely, uh, we started we started growing. Um, and so now we have a wonderful uh, team. Um, obviously, uh, Professor Nordquist is here um, on behalf of the fellowship. Um, Edward Grattan is our managing director, and then Gemma Cooper Novak is a fellowship facilitator and a program manager as well in Syracuse. Uh, and the center at the center of this presentation is our fellowship program. So we'll, I promise we'll get to that in a second. We just wanted to kind of give a background into what it is that we're doing. So over the past five years, uh, we've been able to kind of expand our programs to include the fellowship, to include the obviously the online publishing that was at the heart of it in the very beginning, uh, workshops as well, and partnerships. Uh, so these are some of the partners that we've been able to work with over the last few years. Um, Helen mentioned National Geographic. Um, this is the very most recent one uh, we announced on, was it January 23rd, Bryce? I think that was around then. Um, where uh, they're, they're gonna be working with our fellowship program this summer to focus on uh, photography. So the fellows will be working with National Geographic photographers um, and they'll be supporting us throughout, throughout the program. So uh, we'll talk about all of these partners here in a second, but just wanted to kind of give an overview. So as mentioned before, uh, these are kind of the four pillars of Neratio, you know, publishing, fellowships, partnerships, and uh, workshops, um, all coming together to again, make this, vision possible of this global collective of displaced young people that are trained to share their own stories on their own terms. Um, just a quick overview of our impact. Uh, we've been able to publish over 100 works on our site. Uh, that figure actually is up to almost 200 now. Um, you know, poems, stories, artwork, what have you. Um, we've uh, partnered with a refugee camp in Greece to publish three full-length magazines. Um, it's called the Ritsona Kingdom Journal. That's all on our website. If you'd like to read those um, and we've done again more, more than 15 workshops around the world and have been able to partner with UN agencies and other media outlets to, to reach uh, uh, you know, many people around the world. So we're very, very excited and honored to be doing this work, um, but are constantly finding new ways and looking for ways to, to further, further it. Um, so now uh, the fellowship. So the fellowship, uh, it really all started uh, I think, was it 2018, the, um, the fall of 2018, I traveled to Syracuse University to do a lecture, a public talk, and a workshop. And the workshop was with a local community center called the Northside uh, Learning Center, which is a literacy center that serves everyone from the ages of five to, to 85 in Syracuse. Uh, and it was a snow day. We weren't sure if anyone was gonna show up and we had 50 folks show up uh, across different ages. Um, and uh, the, the person who organized that visit is Professor Nordquist. So that was our original kind of uh, a meeting point. Uh, and then I, you know, I got, I was at Wesleyan at, the, at that point, I was a junior um, and I was really uh, fascinated with this idea of, okay, well, why not make this workshop? And we had, you know, earlier I talked about those 15 workshops around the world or more than 15 workshops. It, it was always kind of a one-off or a two-off thing. And it was time to do something that was more programmatic, something that was, uh, you know, creating a system where, uh, you know, that vision that I talked about can really come to fruition. And so I spoke with, with Bryce and we thought, okay, well, let's, let's make this program. And that's kind of how it all began. So I'll turn it over to Bryce um, to tell us more about the fellowship. And uh, yeah, we'll keep going. Thanks. Thanks. Um, yeah. Thanks for the overview and um, uh, and the intro into the to to how we got started uh, collaborating. I can't believe it's been since 2018. My mind has been foggy in terms of time for this entire year. It feels like we're just kind of in a, a strange loop. But um, yeah. So we're we're kind of uh, into year three of of the fellowship program, and we've now had two cohorts of fellows. Uh, 
uh, and uh, kind of are leading up to a culminating event. But um, as Ahmed said, we, we sort of got started with all of this just from one like really powerful uh, event, uh, one really like powerful uh, workshop night where um, you know, students across like ages and families came together uh, to, to tell stories on their own terms, as Ahmed says, and as, as the mission of uh, Narratio is uh, sort of indicates or is about. Um, I've been working at the Northside Learning Center for almost seven years since I've been in Syracuse. Um, who did, uh, at first, just kind of volunteering and, and like preserving the lives of middle school boys who are kind of jumping off tables or getting into fights and things like that. So, and, and then eventually kind of de developing curriculum for adult literacy and language learning and uh, arts-based programming. So I had been, uh, the North Side is a, is a family literacy center, as Ahmed said, uh, whole families for new, uh, for new Americans. Um, uh, Syracuse is a resettlement city. Um, currently at the North Side, there are large, uh, mainly East African families, um, but with uh, Bhutanese, pop, you know, Bhutanese families and uh, other, e you know, uh, East Asian uh, families. Um, but that has changed uh, over the course of its like 10 years of existence, just with like different sort of uh, populations or communities coming into the city. Um, it's a it's a center where whole families come together from like age four to 84 uh, to you know, for grade school to get help with like school school instruction, um, and then uh, for adults to do like you know cit uh, kind of citizenship types of literacies toward uh, gaining citizenship or workplace literacies. It's a fantastic uh, community, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with in your own kind of context and your own settings. Um, but I've been running art art like sort of based programming through the center with the center uh, for several years before uh, meeting Ahmed and. Uh, um, and before this idea of the fellowship program and, and like Ahmed, uh, even being like sort of located in the place and, uh, you know, kind of a uh, long term participant in the community. I also had a sense of like programs that were more sort of they were fleeting, like a one off where an artist or a professor or a group of people would kind of parachute into the center and would do this really fantastic work with the youth primarily, but then would sort of just disappear, <laughs> disappear for like, you know, for years or maybe forever um, to where we weren't really building the kind of sustained types of relationships, uh, the sustained projects that were generated of students or generations of participants would kind of feed each other and where ultimately the goal would be kind of a self-sustaining program that we could eventually just step away from and turn completely over to, to people within the community who are running it themselves. So Ahmed and I both had this kind of shared purpose from the outset and a shared vision around or a, a kind of pursuit of um, providing opportunities for youth, uh, you know, displaced youth um, to write and create and sort of think, uh, communicate about their experience from whatever angle seemed most um, important to them in a particular moment, seemed truest to them in a particular moment, and that wasn't... Um, wasn't a response to expectations put on them about what their story should be or what they should tell in every context. Um, many of you know, uh, either from your own experiences or from the experiences of, of people that you work with, um, that if you have like a, you know, you've got a, like a white middle-aged professor coming in and asking uh, people to tell their stories, there's a clear expectation, or at least they think they, they think there's a clear expectation of what I want to hear or what people like me want to hear. And in a lot of cases, you know, uh, like the fellows or the people that I've been working with at the North Side, they want to talk about Air Jordans or Steph Curry or, uh, you know, whatever's going on in their lives as multidimensional, complex, uh, people like uh, so the the goal of the fellowship program um, it, as it lined with the goal of Neratio is it was to sort of um, you know give people tools give people support uh, provide opportunities 
um, to tell stories that they that they already have within them to tell and already have the desire and the abilities to tell. Uh, so it's it, this is really not even about empowering youth to tell their stories, as as Ahmed always says, and as as we kind of like always pursue. It's really about activating uh, the power and and the kind of energy um, that that the fellows already have in this program. So um, the fellowship. I'll just give you a quick rundown of the kind of logistics, nuts and bolts of it, because it might be interesting to some of you who are participating or doing arts-based programming or have programming through your uh, through your like local cultural centers or community centers that could uh, somehow relate to this. So the, the fellowship is, uh, it's a year long uh, program that begins with a summer intensive uh, session, like a summer intensive workshop series that lasts about a month. Um, the first step in, in kind of assembling the team, aside from Ahmed and I and other kind of coordinators, is to, to find an artist in residence uh, uh, from a refugee or immigrant background who has, a, has an investment in working with youth uh, in, uh, in, in a particular community. So far it's been Syracuse, but we'll talk about kind of ex extension plans uh, in a bit. But so we're always pairing an artist working across media. So it could be a writer, as in uh, Ahmed's case, as the first artist in residence in Syracuse, or a filmmaker, as in our you know current like artist in resident and cohort group. As Ahmed said, uh, next uh, this coming summer will be a photographer. Um, so working through different media. Um, with a, a cohort of, uh, of, of youth fellows. So all of this effort is always embedded in this sort of second point um, uh, where we're always collaborating intimately with a, with a community center or partnering organization. In Syracuse, this has been the North side uh, where we run, where we host sessions, where the fellows uh, already have a sense of community, um, where we're able to kind of uh, uh, support the programming, especially summer programming of, of the community center, and also like kind of help to amplify the work that they're doing locally um, through these different kind of media connections that the fellowship allows so that the North side uh, is also able to kind of, I mean, um, you know, uh, able to sort of uh, fundraise and, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, promote the activity as part of their programming, promote the fellowship as part of their programming. Um, uh, so, um, so after that step, and th these two components, we have a, a, a fellowship cohort of between eight and 10, um, uh, you know, uh, youth with refugee backgrounds, recent immigrant backgrounds. Um, uh, some, in some cases, uh, these are like very recent, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, very recently entered the U.S. Um, so like this past fellowship cohort, uh, we had a fellow from uh, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo who had been in the States only for, you know, three months before the kind of uh, school shutdowns. And then there are fellows in every cohort that don't remember a time that they weren't in the U.S. Maybe they, they moved at a very young age um, uh, with their families. Uh, their age is 17 to 21 because we're always recruiting fellows who are at educational transition points in their lives whether this is like uh, high school to college or to community college or community college to four year. Uh, so, so this age range is really about not only um, providing the kinds of opportunities and storytelling uh, training at leadership training, but also connecting fellows to educational uh, and career like sort of transition um, uh, and and resources in the in the context of that transition. So we do a lot of academic like sort of counseling and advising a lot of financial aid counseling and advising a lot of like career oriented work if that is what a fellow's like kind of trajectory is. Um, certainly, I mean, I am at Syracuse University, but this is not like a scheme to get folks into uh, Syracuse. We, we're connecting fellows to different kinds of colleges and institutions or, you know, universities all around the region. Um, so uh, this, um, where are we now? We've got this, uh, we work with, yes, this number five is what I just described. Number six um, is uh, a kind of series of the, the, the workshop uh, element of the fellowship program is always kind of project oriented. So the fellows are developing stories that are connected to a particular sort of project that is individual in ways that they're telling kind of their 
their own stories or stories of their communities from their own perspectives, but coordinated in a way to where all the stories kind of work in, uh, you know, work in relation to each other. Uh, sometimes uh, the outcome of this is a kind of exhibit or a public performance on a large national uh, sort of stage, like, like the Metropolitan Museum of Art, um, or it, it always also cycles back around to series of local, uh, local kinds of interactions uh, at you know, local museums or galleries. Uh, sometimes this project uh, kind of results in exhibits so that the function of uh, kind of providing fellows or, or offering opportunities to uh, kind of uh, interact with audiences on a kind of global stage. Um, but then the goal is always to cycle back around to the local so that they can get feedback from their own communities, continue to revise the work uh, in response to the feedback that they get from their own communities, families, friends, uh, folks in their schools and neighborhoods, and that, so that they can start to lead uh, their own kinds of arts-based programming in the context of the fellowship after this uh, kind of cycle back around. So I know there are a lot of like components there, a lot of like movement from you know national to local uh, and the, the relationships, and we're happy to unpack those if that was like sort of too quick. Um, you can see objectives on here. Maybe Ahmed, you wanna like take over? I don't think, Maybe we can just leave these on the screen and not sort of uh, read them aloud. I think we've hit some of these objectives just in the overview. Do you want to yeah. take over some of these? Absolutely, yeah. So I think you know Bryce did a great job of just outlining kind of the the outcomes. Like, what what are we actually trying to achieve here with the fellowship model? Uh, how the model even works? The different stakeholders that are a part of it, um, and these are just kind of you know, very concrete ways that we can kind of extend the effects of, of the model that we just talked about. Um, and so, yeah, a couple of these things, again, it, it, collaboration is at the heart of it between those kind of three three main pieces, the artists in residence, the community center, the university. Um, and then kind of as an additional collaborator, you have, you know, some type of cultural institution. So in, in this case, it was the Met. Um, and I'll go ahead now and talk about the pilot. So what happened during the first year who were those uh, kind of different stakeholders? As we mentioned, um, you've heard about them already in terms of the North side, in terms of the Met. Uh, we'll dive in a little bit more and, and tell you just more about what happened during the very first year. Um, and so the first year, as Bryce mentioned, was, was in Syracuse. Uh, the fellowship was you know, fairly balanced um, in terms of, um, you know, at least uh, gender wise, we had uh, you know, about 45% uh, female, 54% male. Um, folks from, uh, you know, countries from all around the world, but all resettled to Syracuse. Uh, we'll have to break down the countries here in a bit as well. Uh, these were our uh, inaugural fellows, um, just an incredible, incredible group of, of young people. Um, and they were all selected through a process run by the community center. So the community center is really at the center of recruitment. Um, for the fellows, and we obviously support them with the application um, kind of creation and um, you know selection to a point as well. But the community center is really at the heart of this, and that continues to be the case throughout the year and and beyond. Um, and so the main kind of organizing exercise for the first year, since the uh, the focus of the the month was on poetry, but on different kinds of storytelling as well. So. During the residential intensive component in the summer, you have uh, we had you know workshops around uh, uh, podcasting, workshops around uh, photography, workshops around um, you know with folks that are uh, you know really leaders and in, in media that came in and talked to the fellows. But the central kind of thing that we're all working towards was a performance at the Met, and the it was poetry performance. So what the fellows did was that they uh, selected objects from the ancient East Gallery. Uh, excuse me, Ancient East Gallery. Um, these were the 10 objects that they chose. Uh, and they wrote poems reimagining their labels, um, but taking into account their own personal histories, their own personal memories. And then at the end of the month, we traveled down to New York City and they got to perform those poems uh, in the Royal Assyrian Court among, among these objects. Uh, later to wrap up the presentation, we'll show you a video of the fellows entering the Met for the first time and, and participating in that performance. Uh, that performance was called Intertwined Journeys. So the intertwined journeys of objects, of individuals, uh, of their experiences, uh, and also just kind of, you know, really expanding and extending this, this really, really important point 
um, this idea of what it doesn't mean to actually tell your own story on your own terms. Because when the fellows entered the Met, they weren't just entering as young people or as resettled refugee youth. Um, they were entering as poets. They were entering as writers. And that's something that is really at the heart of the program and that uh, you know, is, is further extended throughout. Um, and so in addition to the Met performance in New York, we got to visit different institutions and have sessions there. So here on the left, that's Ibrahim at the UN. We got to tour the UN and, and uh, uh, really kind of just introduce the fellows to that space. Uh, and the fellows would later come back a few months later and perform at the UN. Um, on the right is a photo um, of the fellows at the New York Times. Um, they met with Greg Winter, who's the international um, editor of uh, international desk editor. Um, they had a session there. Um, and then uh, in addition, we, we went to Squarespace, which, uh, the web development company where the fellows had uh, a workshop around web development and they all got free websites for a year. Um, so it's another key part of that trip is that you get to do the performance, but also be introduced to these different institutions. Um, a couple more pictures here uh, of, of the fellows at the UN, Starlin on the right, um, Jamal on the left, um, just a couple more here. Um, again, more photos here, uh, Mohammed on the right, Aid on the left. Uh, these photos are all taken by uh, Eddie Grattan, who's managing director of Naratio and just uh, um, we're so, so lucky that he's also an incredible photographer. So he's, he's been able to just capture the program in a really remarkable way. And his photos of the program have been showcased at Christie's where the fellows have also performed. We'll talk about that here in a second. A um, couple more photos here. It's Noor on the right and then uh, Eid Abshir and Starlin here on the left at the New York Times um, and then the UN on the right. A um, few more photos here. Uh, this, the fellows at the lobby of the New York Times here at the top. Um, and at the bottom meeting with the UN Youth Envoy um, who uh, met with the fellows and, and uh, had a, a little session with them as well. Uh, and then this is the uh, photo was taken at the end of the performance at the Met after they finished performing their poems um, on uh, was it July 31st now. Yeah, July 31st, 2019. Uh, seems like a, a lifetime ago now. L look at all those people packed into one place. It's, uh, it's crazy. Um, and so, yeah, and so something that's really important too, and, and, and Bryce will, uh, can carry over from here, is this idea of, of the local, right? So I talked about the UN, talked about the Met, talked about the New York Times, but the fellowship always circles back to, to the local. Um, and in this case, it was you know, back to the Northside Learning Center. Um, so Bryce, wanna tell, tell, tell us more about kind of the local, local end of things uh, here? Yeah, thanks. Uh Thanks, Ahmed. So um, I won't like sort of go on and on, but um, I think, you know, one thing every time I see these like images and the fellows in different spaces and interacting with uh, different audiences and, and some like sort of really high profile types of places, uh, you know, as Ahmed said, part of the part of the goal is uh, for them to to really kind of see themselves and begin to kind of own identities as cultural agents, as cultural producers. Uh, so that when they enter an institution of power, of cultural power with a lot of cultural capital like the Metropolitan Museum of Art, um, it's important that the folks at the museum, the kind of collaborators um, respond and that the fellows themselves can, uh, are you know, allowed an opportunity, a position uh, or kind of take a position uh, as 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 an agent in that space, and so these opportunities are about kind of building that sense of agency. Um, and you know, some of the fellows like feel it immediately; like they don't need a lot of <laughs> they don't need a lot of like coaching to say you really are, you really can do this. And then some, it's it's the the like the level of growth or the process of kind of them coming into the identity uh, is really is really striking and uh, is a is a kind of radical transformation. And and they function uh, always as a team, always as a group to help each other, like sort of um, kind of uh, you know enter these kinds of spaces from all of their different positions and different backgrounds and, and uh, you know, uh, different levels of comfort. So uh, once uh, they kind of have this um, trip uh, that after a summer intensive period that really solidifies the group, like solidifies the cohort, creates a sense of family, um, then we always uh, sort of do a series of events locally. So these, uh, uh, Ahmed there uh, is showing uh, it, you know, kind of um, an exhibit that is with Eddie's photos, 
uh, and an event, the opening of this exhibit. Um, uh, on the left, this Intertwined Journeys exhibit, which is at the Community Folk Art Center here in Syracuse, um, which this is like, you, you know, uh, it's a, it's a, this is such an amazing representation of the community in Syracuse uh, because it's a really incredibly diverse audience that this draws in people from across the city that wouldn't otherwise be interacting in these spaces and it centers the fellows and their communities at the heart of the event so that people aren't just coming together to sort of uh, like a, in a marketplace that they happen to interact they're coming to celebrate the work of the fellows and the achievements uh, their achievements over the course of an entire year. Um, so uh, the fellows are also kind of moving back and forth between different types of speaking opportunities that come out of the program, whether it's a visit to a college class to talk about, uh, to give an artist talk, or whether it's a performance at 17 on 17, you know, Global Youth Summit at the UN. Um, they're moving back and forth from kind of local spaces, engagement with their own communities to these national audiences in ways that really just solidify the sense of themselves as community leaders, as, you know, um, uh, as, as agents in their societies, in their communities, which is really key for us. Uh, so through the fellowship, we've had opportunities to share fellows work um, through all different kinds of sources, including uh, through Ahmed's uh, book, which is a fantastic book. If you haven't gotten this book, you should definitely get it. It's, it's really amazing. We're actually reading it here in Syracuse as a community reading initiative, uh, reading together uh, to have a kind of group, uh, a, a dialogue uh, connected to an organization here in Syracuse called Interfaith Works. Um, but, but right now I'm, I'm linking up remote uh, readers with youth in different organizations to read the book together. And then the fellows, uh, our, our 2019 uh, cohort of fellows work is published in the book. So uh, students in the city get to read uh, you know, their peers work or people you know, maybe right above them in grade level and say, this is an incredibly motivating type of uh, you know, influence in, in a kid's life. Um, so it's, this has been brilliant and, and a great sort of different platforms to connect. Um, I'll, we can leave these, these are some comments uh, from the fellows about responses to their program. I'm trying to speed through a little bit because we're already at 3.40 and I, we wanna be able to make, uh, like leave as much time as we can. We can, you know, this will be recorded, but we can also share this slide deck for anybody who's interested in uh, looking, taking a kind of slower look at it. Um, Ahmed, do you wanna talk about the, this year's fellowship just in a snapshot? Sure. Yeah, we can. Uh, yeah, we can go go ahead and the Q and A. Time time flew. Um, so yeah, so year two, uh, you know, we were planning to expand the program this summer. You know, Richmond was a, a key, you know, a key goal for us to expand the program, but obviously COVID happened and uh, changed our plans. But we still did it in, in Syracuse. So with the leadership of Bryce and and Gemma and the artist in residence Anna, um, this past summer we did a kind of a hybrid in person virtual model. Um, focused on filmmaking. So the fellows made uh, you know, short autobiographical films uh, based on, on their daily lives. Um, and so we're very, very proud of, of this year's cohort. And, and we have the, you know, the inaugural public screening of those uh, films coming up here on the 26th. Um, and so you're all invited. Please, please join us. Bryce just uh, sent in the Eventbrite link. Um, you can, you know, it's a free, free event. So please, please show up. And it's going to be beautiful. The, the uh, was it six films yeah six films this year we had to cut down the number of fellows you know to manage social distancing uh, measures uh, but they're incredible films so please please do join us um this is just a quick overview of all the different countries that the fellows hail from um you know over the past couple of years uh and then uh last but not least this is the uh this is the invitation um to join us for the 26th again the link for that is in the chat um, Bryce, do you want to do the, the video or do you want to kind of jump in straight to Q&A? What do you think, Helen, anyone else? It's really up to you. Yeah, we have a short video if you want to see like an overview of the Met, it's, but, but we also like, it's not going to break our hearts if you just want to <laughs> jump right into the conversation and we can send the video uh, for, for you all to view um, on your own time or afterwards, whatever you prefer. I don't know where people are at the moment. It's always hard to tell on Zoom, you know. I, for one, would love to see the video. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. All right, guys, I'll stop sharing. You got it. Okay. 
Um, yeah, all right. Oh, that's not the video. Sorry, now it's gonna like, I pulled up the wrong. <laughs> oh, here it is, okay. Um, this video, uh, let's see. It's not giving me this option. Hold on a second, I'm gonna try again. In the meantime, if anyone has any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat box if you like. Mm. It's not, uh, uh, it's not, thanks, yeah, we'll definitely can respond to questions. For some reason, it's not giving me like the optimized video option, but we'll try to just share it as it is and you all keep in mind that this is not optimal. <laughs> but uh, but here, here you go. first walk into the Met, it was like, I was quite nervous, but I didn't want to show it. First time seeing this object in the in the museum, I thought it was gonna be like the size that I was expecting, but it wasn't how I was thinking, and it was small as a button. Hello, my name is Khalija Mohammed, and um, the title of my poem is Nak Iskarik. I had one idea of how everything looked in my head, and like how everything was gonna be displayed, and then like going there and seeing how it actually was, and like seeing this, like have the staff explain to me like what it was and everything like that it was like so different. It was like eye opening. So the object reminded me of my mother. So when we were in Kenya, um, we would go to like the bazaar, which is where all the food would be. And we don't have like grocery like bags, so you would have to carry everything on your head. And that was like the walking image of my mom, like, or she was the walking image of the sculpture. The title of my piece is Nak Iskadik. And just a backstory, Nak Iskadik in our culture means act like a lady. And that's usually a phrase used to put down women and to tell them to like stay in the kitchen and not do what they're like meant to do. So this is to like go off of that. <laughs> As I stand here carrying food on my head, I hope the nutrients can seep through straight into my brain and remold what it means to be a woman. Not is getting one, two, three. And there it is. And I just uh, sent in the video link in the chat if you'd like to see it. Um, sorry, if it showed up a bit uh, laggy on here, you can never tell with Zoom. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that video. I'll put the fellowship's website in the chat box as well. Um, and does anyone have any questions? Feel free to unmute yourself. 
So Molly said, thank you so much. Really great work you're all doing. A few questions, feel free to leave time for others. What is the selection process like for fellow fellowships? I suppose they're funded by partners. Uh, where else do you work besides Syracuse, if anywhere? Um, and I know you mentioned Kriz Ahmed, but anywhere in the US? Yeah, all, all great questions. Um, I think was it uh, Katie, Kate, you asked about the, the book. So I'm sending the link for the book site, which has all buying options. And if you go on the indie bound one, you can find like order it through a local bookstore um, or, or bookshop as well. Um, thank you. Thank you for asking. Uh, Bryce, do you want to tackle any of these? Let's see, selection process. Um, we have the community center. So they have a, a call uh, for uh, fellows that goes out. Um, then, you know, when those come in, uh, we all kind of the kind of the executive committee and then the kind of the committee within the center uh, go over all the applications and then the selection uh, happens, happens that way. Um, and then funding is, is uh, kind of a patchwork of funders. We have university funding, um, some city funding in Syracuse so that all the fellows get stipends for participating, um, you know, because it's a month in the summer, a full on months. And, Oftentimes the fellows have to pick up other jobs. So we wanna make sure that they are able to kind of fully participate and that their time, uh, you know, is, is uh, appreciated in that way. Um, and then besides Syracuse, this is the, the question. So we wouldn't, we really wanna expand it uh, as much as possible. And Richmond is still very much, you know, a place that we wanna go, a place that we wanna expand it. Um, you know, it's just a matter of, I think when, um, you know, rather than if so. I would love you know your thoughts, any ideas, any anything that comes up that you know you think might be able to, to be doable. Would love to would love to discuss that. Um, this summer we're thinking of Houston as well. Um, I'm here in Houston, and we have some great partners here too. To potentially spread it here, um, and then uh, yeah, I'm sorry if I missed any of the questions. Bryce, feel free to to fill in. No, those are those are really uh, they're good questions. The, yeah, as Ahmed said, the uh, the community partner and uh, certainly Syracuse, uh, the Northside Learning Center, but in any you know other location will be really key to uh, recruiting the fellows uh, to sort of helping us connect. Um, uh, yeah, we could come to Pittsburgh for sure. <laughs> um, so yeah, so uh, and then the fellows actually, you know, now that we have multiple cohorts of fellows. Uh, they really kind of uh, help recruit each other. I mean, you know, so that, uh, you know, different generations of different students and fellows uh, are, are kind of now ambassadors for the program and are connecting, you know, their younger brothers and sisters or their schoolmates. Um, uh, and, and, and then they're also co-leading, you know, so the, so the 2019 uh, fellowship cohort came back to lead workshops and to talk about their own experiences. Khadija did a, a whole session on poetry and activism. Um, you know, other fellows have come in to comment on the, the current cohort of fellows films. So there's this like sort of uh, extended kind of family that continues to cycle back in to support each other, to provide mentorship. We have fellows who have transitioned uh, to four year uh, university who are like guiding uh, the current cohort of fellows through their own transition processes in, in terms of educational transition. Transitions, uh, so the, the so that at this point the the recruiting and the selection process, uh, the 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 previous cohorts of fellows are really uh, you know um, you know uh, involved in that process and in, in, in really ways that are important and um, formative for the whole program. So, thank you for answering that. I have one question. I'm curious about how do you decide what, whether to focus like each group or report on filmmaking or photography or poetry? Is it based on the, their, the fellow's interests or the artists in residence or both? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a first shot and then you wanna take over. But yeah, I mean, sometimes it's about like driven by the collaborators. And as Ahmed said, we have like patchwork funding. It's not like we're like kind of 
you know, we have an endowment and we're like kind of just making all the decisions we want to make. So, you know, so for the National Geographic, we had already had in mind to have a photographer at some point um, cycle into one of the cohorts. And so it really worked out that the National Geographic was going to support and provide mentorship. So the photographer, the artist working uh, in Syracuse this year may not at all be associated with National Geographic, but uh, they'll be working with uh, a couple of mentors who are National Geographic photographers. So, so there's like a kind of layering of mentorship happening where um, a photographer with a refugee or immigrant background, hopefully who's local uh, to the place, will be working with professional photographers to get a sense of what this life is like, but also will be kind of co-designing different sessions and the programming itself with us and with this, uh, with the, the kind of photographers from National Geographic to run the session. So sometimes it will, and, and then the, the partnership that Ahmed is mentioning in Houston is was with an organization called WITS, uh, which is, uh, it, it's, a, it's a writing uh, organization. And so through the, through these different partnerships, um, you know, the kinds of orient, you know, the kind of selection of, of uh, an artist kind of emerges uh, from the collaboration itself. Um, so we, yeah, we, but we, I don't think we've ever said like, okay, this year we're gonna have a filmmaker and that's what we're like set on. It's always like kind of emerging from, as you said, Helen, like the desires of the, of, of, of the fellows and uh, maybe like what we think will work well in a particular context in terms of, you know, what we're able to do in time and what resources we might have um, available, things like that, so. And sometimes the call for proposals for the artists is open-ended on purpose. Yeah. That's how it was this past summer. Um, and so don't like the, the kind of the best candidate with the best proposal ended up being a filmmaker. So yeah. that was the focus. Um, so sometimes it's, it's very much shaped by the partner, but in other cases, there's a bit more flexibility. It's a great question. Yeah. And I have a question as well. Um, have there been any sort of conversations in expanding the fellowship to individuals that may not be in a traditional like educational institution? Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I was I, I'm so bad at trying to keep up with like chat. I'm I'm really apologize for having to, to make you repeat that question. But can you can you just rephrase? I'm so sorry. Yes, no problem. I'm just wondering, has there been any conversation in terms of expanding the fellowship to individuals that may not be in a traditional educational institution, like they're not transitioning to a community college or maybe they're not in a high school. So have there been conversations on, I guess, what a Noratio fellowship looks like and who it may be for, depending on educational background? Yeah, that's a really great question. And actually, you know, uh, some of the fellows are not like, you know, they're maybe not in school at the moment that they're participating in the fellowship. So they may be like in a year where uh, they don't know what to do next and don't have a clear sense of what they want or are not able to kind of access the resources because of, because, because of the, you know, incredibly flawed ways that institutions and systems work and school systems in particular. So, uh, so absolutely it could, it, you know, the fellowship cohorts are often a combination of students who uh, are in school, uh, who have like a clear sort of sense of what they want to do next and people who maybe have been out of school for one or two years are not quite certain or are in a kind of stage of transition from community college and don't know what to do after. So the, the kind of educational career support is really not like, oh, you have to end up in this particular kind of institution or here's the target. It's really directed by the fellow's own like desires, aspirations. And what we're trying to do is kind of connect them to resources to help get them to whatever their own target is. Um, but, you know, in terms of partnering with institutions like, you know, uh, I mean, I think it would be, we would be completely open. I think it would be wonderful if, if there were ways to partner with, you know, um, correctional facilities and, or like sort of, uh, you know, um, other types of non-traditional schooling or students who um, are trying to re-enter an education system in one way or another. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, it, we would be completely open um, and inviting of that for sure. It's a good, it's a good question and a good thought for, for thinking forward. 
Mm-hmm. And at the heart of the fellowship too, is this idea that, you know, we're not coming, that the educational transition part is there for whoever is interested in it as part of the program. We don't kind of recruit fellows specifically with that in mind. Um, obviously it, it enters the equation at some point, but uh, you know, it's, it's, we're just kind of there to the, offer the resources as, as needed. And in some cases, you know, it might not, it's just not the best fit. So it's a great question and something we definitely, I think, need to, uh, you know, we've thought about a lot already, but need to think about a lot more. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think to add on to that, I'd be curious, I'm making the assumption that most of the fellows have a relatively decent fluency with English if they're probably interacting with all these, you know, community partners. I'd be curious to know about, you know, is there any kind of requirements around English or literacy skills in particular um, as well? Bryce, yeah, do you want to go ahead and answer that one? We were just talking about this very recently. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, Actually, like, you know, the fellows have like different, I mean, they're all incredibly linguistically resourceful, uh, you know, multilingual, um, but have different kinds of proficiencies with English. Um, So uh, it's not a requirement that the fellows be able to kind of, uh, you know, be literate in English or um, uh, even have like a particular kind of conversational like proficiency. Um, What happens is that, well, the program is kind of um, always uh, encouraging fellows to bring all of their linguistic and communicative resources to to their expression. So even in the poetry at the Met, uh, there are like large sections of poems that are entirely in Somali or Arabic or, you know, um, and, and certainly that's the case with the films this year. We absolutely, we want student, uh, the fellows to feel like, um, you know, they have all of these incredible resources uh, to communicate with more than most, you know, <laughs> monolingual, English monolingual people for sure. Uh, so, you know, we want them to, to use all of those resources. Uh, and it, what happens, in, in, even in a, in a workshop setting where you're working with people who are kind of, uh, you know, have different, you know, uh, you know, have different access to languages. Um, often what happens is like kind of translation within the group. So, you know, uh, fellows will help each other if, if somebody's like trying to sort of express a particular concept, uh, you know, or a technical term that has to do with like film that I don't, that I don't even, you know, I wouldn't even be like fluent in, uh, but translating that into kind of a, you know, a Somali or a kind of, you know, Eritrean like equivalent, um, that usually happens just because of the ways that, uh, you know, communities intersect in spaces like this or in centers like this. So it's very rarely the case that we'll have uh, you know, only one fellow who speaks Swahili and who is like completely on their own, usually because we're, we're just, or, you know, kind of naturally, organically, um, you know, bringing in people who have, you know, different periods of time in the U.S. school system and different kinds of language resources from their own communities. It's a kind of collaborative, you know, supporting each other to understand or to make the most use of of the different kinds of uh, you know forms of expression that we're trying to trying to help uh, help teach or give them exposure to. So, thank you for answering that. Any other questions? Maybe one more question before we wrap up. Maybe not, Uh, but I just wanna say, um, keep an eye out for an email right after this session uh, where we're gonna be sending a follow-up survey and the links to these recordings. Um, So keep an eye out for that. Yeah, please stay in contact. I'm sorry, you were probably going to say the same thing. We would love to hear more about what you all are doing, um, you know, from different locations. I'm sure there are a lot of intersections here that we just don't have the time to explore. So please be in touch. Uh, we would really love to hear from you and uh, and to learn from you. You know, I mean, I feel always these things feel kind of one-sided and um, we know you're all <laughs> you're doing such important and uh, crucial work. So uh, we would love to hear about it. Absolutely. And then just yeah. echoing that, and I want to make sure to acknowledge Marilyn and Joel's uh, comment that program sounds incredible, as Bryce mentioned. 
Um, and uh, yeah, it's just, it's always such a, when you think about art education in the context of these programs, the, the potential is always really, really exciting. And we're always kind of trying to find new ways to, to expand and, and, and challenge and kind of extend what we're trying to do. So uh, yeah, and thank you for, again for the opportunity. It's been so wonderful to, to share this Zoom space with you today. Thank you. I think Marilyn is showing us the program paperwork. It came, they, they wrote this, uh, well, they did a um, Khmer kaleidoscope and then they did Reflections of Southeast Asia, which is full of their photography and drawings and writing. That's fantastic. Wow, you had that at hand. That's amazing. Hey, this was dear to me. <laughs> <laughs> And it, it, I think we framed it as a dropout prevention program, and uh, we had a dynamite uh, coordinator, and we we really pulled people out of gang involvement, and 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 we were so successful that the folks at ORR said that we had um, we hadn't really taken at risk for youth <laughs> for our program, and mm -hmm. believe me, these kids were were very much uh, struggling to, to stay in school. So um, anyway, it's just another model of engaging young people in art and uh, they really were proud of their work. It sounds, it looks fantastic. And this kind of community publishing uh, is, is really so powerful. I mean, you know, you all I'm sure have like in, in, the, in the centers you work in and the kinds of organizations you work in, you know, to have materials that are created, uh, you know, from folks within the community, from uh, that are circuit, you know, you can circulate within, uh, and and so folks can see generations of people who have been doing this work. This is really such an important uh, and powerful kind of uh, resource to have uh, for um, for communities. So yeah, it looks like great work, Marilyn. Thanks for showing it. Thank you. I think Richmond is is a good place. I think we're right. I think that Richmond is is a, is a good place to be. I think there's such, you know, just so much art and there's so many new things coming out, especially over the last year, a lot of energy around um, artistic expression. So I hope we can find a way to get it here sooner than later. Yeah, well, as Ahmed said, I think it's just a matter of time. And it's, it's like sort of in this moment, as you all know, like planning, like tomorrow feels like so uncertain. And then, you know, thinking, well, what was the situation going to be like for everyone in, in two months or three months or four? It feels like we don't know what, how far is safe to project yet. And I know that everyone is in the same, same place, but we absolutely are very eager. Uh, and we've been in conversation with, with you yeah. all and folks there for now over a year. Um, uh, so I, I think it's, yeah, it's, it, it's just a matter of time. And, and we know what, as I said, we know what kind of amazing work that you're doing there. We, so we would, uh, we would love to, to be a part in, in one way or another. I would look forward to bringing this fellowship and opening it up to people here, hopefully um, at some point. Uh, thank you. All. Thank you both for being here and for telling us more about it. Uh, thank you for everyone who joined in and listened throughout this week. Um, I attended a lot of the session and I learned a lot. I hope you did too. Uh, so let us know your feedback in the follow up survey. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Have a great weekend. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>